Thank you. I was amazed by the little lad there, th b b concentrating on every word of the philosophy lecture. You're very impressive to, <laughs> to keep him there, so that's very impressive, but he's not here now. I've got one or two slides that probably won't, are less appropriate for him in a minute, but otherwise it's uh, gory free. Um, I, I'm a fellow here at Teddy Hall. I'm professor of uh, children's surgery uh, up at the John Radcliffe, and also I head uh, the adult islet cell programme for diabetes, which is what I'm going to be concentrating on uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes. Um, I think it's important to, to just give a bit of background. Type 1 diabetes, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, is uh, uh, an autoimmune disease in which the patient's body uh, has attacked, for some reason, its own insulin-producing cells. Um, that's to be distinguished from type 2 diabetes, which, of course, is the obesity-related diabetes, which we hear about so much nowadays, in which insulin production is still uh, relatively normal, but the body is resistant and doesn't recognise the insulin uh, that it's producing. Now, type 1 diabetes largely starts in childhood, and its mainstay treatment is insulin injections or insulin treatment, <coughs> uh, insulin therapy of different sorts. And I think it's important at the very beginning, when we're talking about state-of-the-art treatments I'm going to be highlighting in a moment, it's really important to go back to the history and remember the incredible discovery of insulin back in the 1920s. Because up until that point, uh, type 1 diabetes really was an untreatable disease. And the picture you hear on, see on the right-hand side here is not of a supermodel. This is, not, this is a, a, a child who was diagnosed back in the 1930s with type 1 diabetes. You see the cachexia here, the wasting, and then six months later, you see the impact that uh, insulin therapy has made. So this patient would have not survived uh, before insulin therapy uh, was readily available. The other thing to remind as well, I think, in context, diabetes mellitus, the word mellitus, those classics people here remember uh, that that is uh, <coughs> meaning either honey or sugar or sweetness. That's what its name is meant. And it originates as well from when doctors, when we were diagnosing diabetes, we used to have to taste the urine and uh, see how sweet it was. Now, with the current cuts in the NHS, we may be having to uh, <laughs> go back to that. But uh, <coughs> <We're getting graduate. laughs> so, um, as with many medical discoveries, we often then create another problem further uh, downstream. And in this example, whereas type 1 diabetes, certainly in the Western world, is largely a treatable disease in the acute phase of the disease, we then have uh, the challenge further down the stream of the chronic complications of the disease, such as blindness, retinopathy, uh, kidney failure, and also heart and uh, blood vessel disease of the limbs. And we know that uh, these are caused uh, multifactorially, the causes, but the main uh, reason these are developed is the high sugar levels. And therefore, we know from a number of trials and from uh, different studies that if we can keep the blood sugar as tight as possible from the onset and throughout life, we can try and reduce those complications as much as we can. Now, there are genetic factors and other factors as well, but by and large, the high glucose is the one that causes these uh, really difficult uh, complications. And so the current treatments that we're trying to develop are all trying to target the early phase whereby we can try and prevent these complications from, from uh, happening rather than treating them once they've already developed. Now, there are a number of ways of doing that. Obviously, insulin treatment is the mainstay treatment, and you can do that by giving more intensive insulin rather than just twice daily insulin. You can give insulin pumps in which there's a constant trickle of insulin going in. But the problem with these is, although they're very good and imp in increasingly good at keeping diabetes under control, they're not reversing the disease. They're not getting back to the normal situation in the pancreas where the so-called islets of Langerhans, which are these little clusters of cells that have been destroyed, are again <coughs> producing the insulin in a very controlled manner. So in, in terms of the insulin secretion in the normal pancreas, the minute-to-minute -minute response is happening, whereas with insulin injections, of course, you're just giving it at set times during the day or a little trickle. You're never getting back to this really erudite process of normal secretion. In addition, you're only giving insulin, and we know that these islets produce a whole lot of other hormones, somatostatin, glucagon, and we know that these different hormones need each other to have the most refined blood sugar control, a bit like a brake and an accelerator. In this case, you're with insulin, you're only giving the brake. And therefore, the other approach is to transplant the insulin-producing tissue to replace it to give that erudite tissue back. And that can either be <coughs> in the form of a whole pancreas transplant, which is a major operation, 
highly successful, but it is a major operation with, huge, with, with quite high morbidity and indeed a, a reasonable mortality as well. But it is very good in selected patients with severe complications already. The other hand, though, is to then extract these islet cells and give a minimally invasive islet-specific cell transplantation. And this is what we're trying to do and we think is going to be the most applicable for children. Now, a very quick word about islets of Langerhans. Uh, the islets of Langerhans are scattered throughout the pancreas. The pancreas sits here behind the stomach. And the, the biggest function of the pancreas is actually producing enzymes that, that uh, digest your food. So that's what the main function is. But 2% but of the pancreas is responsible for making these hormones, insulin and the other ones I've just mentioned. And these are little balls of cells called islets of Langerhans. He was a medical student, Paul Langerhans, when he discovered these. Still got any medical students here got uh, uh, some challenge to, to try and replicate this sort of discovery. Um, and it's made up of two to 5,000 cells, each of these little balls. And they're scattered uh, throughout the pancreas, perhaps slightly more in the tail, although that's slightly questioned nowadays. And so the challenge for islet transplantation, and I'm not going to touch on it at all today, but the real challenge actually is this extraction of these little balls of cells. And uh, quite a lot of our research is, is also looking at that uh, aspect. The islet transplant is a minimally invasive procedure. It's either done through uh, keyhole surgery or more commonly we do it through um, a, a, a little injection across uh, with a needle under x-ray control. And in an adult patient, they have local anaesthetic, they have a bit of sedation. Um, but otherwise they are awake through the procedure, it's well tolerated. And the islets are literally infused, about 5 mils of tissue, diluted in about 200 mils of solution, are then uh, infused into the liver. And the liver is like a honeycomb. And these islets get trapped inside this structure, they set up their own blood supply, nerve supply, and they start to function as if they were uh, in the pancreas originally. And we know that this can work uh, very effectively in selected patients. And we also know that as a cellular transplant, we think there's a whole lot of other strategies that we can develop and are developing to mean that ultimately this is one of the few transplants that may well be able to be given without the need for long-term anti-rejection medication. Now, I talked about the bench to bedside, and this is just really to show that over the last 30 years, there's been a huge uh, move from the bench where we were r routinely reversing diabetes in animals with islets. I started in about 19... Uh, uh, 89, I think, when I first got involved in this in Leicester. Um, and we then transplanted a number of different uh, uh, small trials. We had about 12 transplants in this country. And again, there was a big discovery in, in a new protocol, which was steroid-free, and suddenly the success rates leapt up. And since then, we've been trying to get more consistent results in more patients. And um, the key thing about bench-to-bedside research, however, for the younger people here, is that, yes, we start with a clinical problem, we then take it back to the research, to the laboratory. We then answer that question. We bring it back to a clinical treatment via trials first, of course. But then there's always another question to go back to the bench with. So this isn't a unidirectional. It is a circle the whole time. And the beauty about being a clinician scientist is that you're involved in that rotation all the time with collaborations with a whole range of very, very uh, bright people in terms of different elements of both medical research but also uh, things like biomaterials that I'm going to touch on to in a minute. This is just one slide on the results. Uh, we had the leap of success uh, in the night, beginning of the 2000s, the so-called Edmonton Protocol. What we see here is that 80% of selected patients, and these are selected patients, were becoming insulin independent off insulin altogether for at least a year after the procedure. It then started to tail down as you start to look at sort of 14, 15 years, down to only 11%. But the newer protocols that we're using now, we're seeing about 58% of patients off insulin for seven years uh, after this treatment. But more importantly, we're seeing very tight control and other complications being improved. It isn't <coughs> just about getting people off insulin, and we make sure that we make patients aware of that. What I want to touch on now, just as we close, is, the, is, the, is one element of our research, and that is that at the moment we're treating people once the horse has bolted, so to speak, once they've developed complications, once particularly they have got no awareness of their low blood sugars, which is a very dangerous situation uh, to be in, and this reverses that almost uniformly. What we need to get to, however, is a situation where we're able to treat newly diagnosed people with type 1, and that means it needs to be uh, treatments that are applicable not just for adults but in childhood. 
And the one thing, or the biggest thing I'd say, I could give a whole slide of all the different challenges, but that would uh, go well beyond the time. But I think the single challenge that we need to overcome before we can move it to children is nothing to do with the techniques we use. I think they're usable at the moment. It is this need for lifelong anti-rejection drugs. Because anti-rejection drugs suppress your immune system, and in turn, they then give you the high risk of cancer and potentially uh, the risk of, um, uh, of infections as well. And there are two approaches as I close. First of all, you can either alter the immune system, so-called immune tolerance, using some of the similar things we just see with immunotherapy, particularly T-regulatory cells. Or you can isolate the islets from the immune system, and that's so-called encapsulation technology. And you can either do microencapsulation. These are little, these are islets here, the white things inside an alginate capsule. The insulin is secreted through the tiny pores in this capsule, but the immune molecules are prevented from reaching the islet. Or you can use macroencapsulation, in which case you have islets sitting within a large capsule, rather than individually coated, they're in a device. The device goes under the anterior abdominal wall, and this is the one picture I was uh, not going to show a younger child. Uh, is here we see it sitting under, it develops a blood supply, and then two weeks later we then can infuse the islets. And at the moment this is experimental, but we hope to move it in clinical trials in the not too distant <coughs> future. We have a whole range of different things, looking at the biocompatibility, the different membrane compositions, uh, the number of islets that we'll be using, and this really exciting area of combining this with a whole lot of solutions, including mesenchymal stem cells and various other things that provide successful uh, survival of the islets. This is just showing secretion of insulin through the pores and a block of, in, in this example, the IgG uh, immune molecules. And this is showing some uh, experimental animal models showing the actual secretion in these devices working with islet secretion and suppression of the diabetes. And the final slide I just want to show is that we also have a, a big uh, European collaboration, uh, uh, Horizon 2020, looking at developing biomaterials that coat the islets that themselves secrete immunosuppression locally rather than in the whole body. And this is a very exciting uh, uh, movement as well. So in conclusion, islet transplantation works really well in selected patients. We've now got NHS funding here in Oxford to do it, and we send islets to seven places around the country. We need to develop these protocols before we can move it to children, and there's a whole lot of other techniques we think we can use further down the line. And I'd just like to thank my, uh, my team who are doing the hard work and who are busy preparing to do one tonight, and these are our funding bodies, and thank you for your attention. Yeah.